when it comes to politics, when it comes to dating, when it comes to family, when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to gender, when it comes to everything, all of us want to do the right thing, but it's, it's pretty hard to know what to do when you're not sure exactly what's true. Uh, the simple fact is, at the end of the day, every one of us is believing some voice, and this series is all about figuring out which voice we should believe. It's really hard to know what to do when you're not exactly sure what's true. Let me repeat that, because I think it's really important. Um, it is really hard to know what to do when you're not quite sure what is true? When it comes to the morality of sexuality, who's, whose truth do you trust? Like, ask your grandparents, and they would probably say this. Uh, ask the average college student, and they'd, they'd probably say that. Um, ask a pastor like me, and I'd tell you A. Find another pastor in town, and they would tell you B. Some cultures would say this, other cultures would say that. You might really feel this and another person might really feel that. And this is no small thing, right? This is not how you're going to vote every four years. This is your, your love life, your relationships, your possible marriage, your, your family. If you care about God, you, you probably want to do the right thing in his eyes. But it's really hard to know what to do when you don't know what's true. Or you're sitting on the back deck or on the dinner table with your extended family and your brother's there and your, your mom and dad are there and some you know, big social issue comes up and in like 30 seconds, it's gotten really like tense in the room and, and passionate. Um, you might be talking about race. You might be talking about uh, climate change. You might be talking about the, the police force. And, and your dad heard this on cable news and, and your brother learned this when he was at college and you know a police officer, a friend who's black, and, and they say this, and, and you've always kind of had this hunch in your own heart that that is more closer to the truth. So what, what do you do? How do you react? What do you say? What, what do you stand for? When there's 15 conflicting ideas and they can't all be true, which truth do you choose? It's hard to know what to do when you're not sure what's true. Or maybe that moment comes uh, for you or for someone you really care about when you realize that your same-sex attraction, it isn't changing. And you didn't choose it, and it feels like there's nothing that you can do to change it. It's just this desire, and yes, you've prayed, and, and no, it hasn't gone away, so what, what do you do? Whose truth do you trust? Do you go with the historic position? Do you go with the modern one? Do you go with your gut, your, your intuition? Do you trust your elders? Do you believe the people who have the holy book and have studied it the longest? And if so, which people who have the book and studied it the longest do you agree with? <laughs> Truth. Whose do you trust? Now, 2,000 years ago, uh, Jesus of Nazareth said this in John chapter 8. He said, The truth will set you free. If you could just figure out what the truth is, according to Jesus, it would set you free. Uh, you would be released from wondering, from doubting, from questioning yourself from wondering what God thinks, if you could just stumble upon the truth, if you could find it, according to Jesus, it would set you free. And that's why for the next few weeks, uh, I want to join Jesus in a passionate pursuit of the truth. All right, we're going to talk about all kinds of things in the weeks to come. We're going to talk about whether you should trust your truth. You know, go with your gut, let your heart be your guide, follow your heart, be true to yourself. Is, is that true? And then we're going to talk about their truth. We're going to talk about culture. We're going to talk about your parents. 
We're going to talk about your friends. We're going to talk about your favorite YouTubers, Instagrammers, cable news hosts. Should we trust them? When, how much should we trust them? When should we trust them? How should we listen to their truth? And then, this is going to be the fun part, we're going to talk about people like me and places like this. How do you know if you can trust the church? Should you? With the church's obvious historical flaws, should there be anything in this place that you lean in and listen to? Whose truth do you trust? We're going to go on that journey together. But I want to warn you up front, um, the more I've thought about this and, and I've written all these messages already, the, the more I've become convinced of this, that you need two qualities to come anywhere close to the truth. You have to be humble and you have to be hardworking. Right? Proud people don't want to change. They're going to pick in truth, choose the, the kind of sources that let them stay comfortable. You have to be humble. And you have to be hardworking. It is easy and convenient just to believe everything you read. It takes a lot of work, like a good journalist, to check sources, survey sizes, samples, to, to test theories, to put, push on weak spots. But, but if you are willing today to be humble and hardworking, then Jesus is willing to lead you to the truth. So, if you're up for that journey, well, let's kick things off with the most popular place in modern culture to find truth here. My truth. Your truth. Uh, that's what Moana did. And if you remember the 2016 Disney movie, Mo Moana? Yeah, you, you got a Moana tattoo, didn't you, sir? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Speaking of, <laughs> I was going to pick on someone. I didn't know it was going to be you until you sat right there. <laughs> yeah, so if you haven't heard the plot, Moana is this uh, beautiful little cartoonish uh, island teenager, and her parents are grooming her to be the next chief of their island. But in her heart, she doesn't want to. Now, instead, she feels this pull, this calling, and this destiny to travel beyond the reef and to explore the ocean. The problem is, however, is that her truth is not their truth. Her father absolutely forbids it. Her mother sympathizes but laments it. It's just not going to happen. The island, the village isn't ready for it. But then, the music begins. And uh, I asked my oldest daughter about this part of the message. She said, Dad, you cannot sing, so I won't. <laughs> uh, but do you remember the lyrics? You know, she feels like the sea is calling her and no one knows how far she'll go. And it's so catchy, little kids singing at karaoke all the time. And in the end, what Moana decides is to be true to herself. She disobeys her father. She disregards her mother. She turns her back on the advice of almost all of her neighbors and she lives her truth. And by the end of the movie, her truth has set everyone free. And that is the perfect message of modern culture. Mom might not agree, dad might not agree, it not might be normal around here, but if you look deep inside, if you are true to yourself, you will find the most important thing in the universe. Hey, and when I slow down and think about that idea, I, I think there's something to it. All right, we didn't have time to pass a microphone around church today, but, but I have a hunch that you are a little bit different than your dad or your mom or your siblings or your classmates. There's something about you, the way you're wired, your passions and your personality that doesn't quite fit into the mold of your parents. Right, like, some of you had those like meat and potatoes kind of fathers. You know what I'm talking about? The, the farmers, the factory workers, you, you keep your head down, you bite your lip, you, you do the same job for 40 years, you provide for those that you care about. And that's not you. You're artistic, you're creative, you're adaptable. You don't want to tinker with some widget for 40 years. You, you want to see the world. You, you want to live simply. You want to explore. Your passion is not his passion. You, you are not him. The apple has fallen very far from the tree. And, th and there's something to be said for not being him, but for being you. 
Should I follow my heart? Should, should I go with my gut? Should, should I take this advice, look within, and let no one deny what I consider to be true? Well, if you're taking notes here or at home, I want you to write this down. The Bible would say to that question, should I live my truth? The Bible's answer would be, maybe. <laughs> if you could somehow speed read the Bible cover to cover after church today, the, the Bible would say, maybe. Uh, I won't cover all the Bible's support of the concept, but let me give you two quick passages. Uh, the first one comes from Romans chapter 2, uh, where the Apostle Paul says this. He says, The requirements of the law, so the law is like God's law, God's truth, are written on their hearts. Their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. Sometimes when your gut says, this isn't right, God agrees. Sometimes when your, your conscience defends itself, no, no, I, I'm not in the wrong, God agrees. In fact, sometimes when everyone else in the room is saying A and, and you feel within B, God looks at you and he says, me too. Now, that might seem like a dangerous thing to say, right? Like your vote could outvote the other 10 people in the room, but actually that's, that's true. Forgive the gross analogy, but I call this the bathroom factor. Do you know the people who forget exactly how bad a public bathroom smells? The people who've been in it the longest. Do you know how bad, who knows perhaps better than anyone how bad the bathroom actually smells? The person who just walked in. Do you know who sometimes knows, really from God's perspective, what's good or bad about a church, a school, a family? The person who walks into the room for the very first time and listens to their own conscience. Or sometimes after a while, you know, the person at the school, maybe even the pastor at the church, everyone is kind of used to like the outbursts and the anger and the impatience. Sometimes it takes a brand new member to say, but that's not okay. Oh, that's just pastor so and so. You'll get used to it after a while. No, <laughs> no, no, no. My heart is telling me this is not good, this is not godly, this is not kind, this is not appropriate. And if that weren't enough of a case, let me show you one more passage. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul said this, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. When it comes to the difference between hands and feet, it, it's pretty easy to see the difference. When it comes to the differences in people and their gifts, not so easy to see the difference. Right? I mean, I can't look at you like I could my eyes or my ears and see the label that God stamped on your forehead like, this is your part, this is your gift. <laughs> so how am I going to know if it's your gift, if it's your passion, if it's what you were made to do unless, unless you speak from within? Right? How am I going to know if you're right for public speaking if you could do announcements, if you could stand on the stage, if you could lead a group, like how am I going to know if that fires you up or that terrifies you unless you speak from the heart? You know, some of you are amazing at small talk, right? You, every gas station attendance, they don't even see you coming, right? Every, every way just doesn't know what's about to, like you love it. You're just going to win over a perfect stranger in 30 seconds or less and others of you hate it, right? Small talk is the worst. How, how am I going to know that that's how you feel unless you speak the truth. And so we could talk about your conscience. We could talk about your spiritual gifting. We could talk about your thoughts. We could talk about your experiences. If you would ask the God of the Bible, should I live my truth? His answer would be, maybe. Like how you feel about something may be exactly how God feels about it.
or maybe not. If you want to know the whole truth about my truth, grab your pen and write this down too. Ask God, should I live my truth? He might say to you, maybe not. Should I accept all of the desires in my heart like they're from God? Should I assume that my initial reaction to a situation is accurate? Should I always follow my heart because that's you leading me, God? He would say, I love you, but maybe not. The basic problem with the concept of living your truth is that it's not always true. What a person feels is good or bad, right or wrong, is not always factual. And I bet you've seen this, right? You have a family member and everyone in the family is concerned how much he's drinking. And you try to talk to him about it and he feels like it's under control. That's what he feels. Should he live his truth? (laughs) Should he keep going? No, we need to intervene. We need to stop. God, help us. We're, We're praying this needs to change because what he feels is not the truth. <laughs> My wife's a preschool teacher. Sometimes she hears the, the, the 911, like a kid's being murdered in the corner of the classroom. She comes over, you know, a little three-year-old who has all the toys and he's holding on to him like this. And she says, Johnny, do you think it's okay to have all the toys? And what does Johnny say? Yes. <laughs> Well, no, okay, Johnny, you, you might feel it, you might believe it, but that's not okay. She needs to speak truth to him, not just accept the, the truth that comes from him. Those of you who've been in relationships, you, you felt this too, haven't you? Like, you're just like eighth place on the list that she's so devoted to the kids, he's so devoted to his work. They come home and, and their first priority is their phone and emails from the job they just left and you try to express that you're lonely, that something isn't right about this, and they, they feel like you're overreacting, that they feel like the situation is fine. Is what they feel factual? Mm-mm. You see, this is Jesus' problem with the concept of living your truth. It might be good, it might not be. It might be sanctified and holy, or it might not be. This is why the Apostle Paul, the same guy who wrote the stuff about the conscience and our thoughts and our hearts, he also said this in Ephesians chapter 4. He said, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Like, don't live like those people. Okay, Paul, how do those people live? He says, They live in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is, don't miss these two words, in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Honestly, I wish I couldn't relate to any of that. So I've been following Jesus for 40 years years now, plus. Um, Someone asked me a couple days ago how many times I've read the Bible cover to cover. Um, Fifteen, at least. Even Leviticus. Uh, Are there times, though, when what I feel doesn't line up with that book? How I instinctively react to situations? Um, I I wish. (laughs) I wish I could tell you otherwise. I notice it most, and I'm not sure if any of you have been there. Um, when I get into a disagreement with my wife, which I'm grateful is, is pretty rare, my heart has, the, if it wasn't evil, it would be impressive. My heart has this instinctive ability, as soon as the first criticism comes, in less than a second, to produce an Excel spreadsheet of, of all the things that I have done right in marriage. Right? Just, honey, Just pause those words and I'm going to speak and I'm going to remind you what a great husband you got. (laughs) At the same time, it's running another report which reminds me of all the things that she's not doing so well and when it's my turn, I could say all that. And 
and I think some of you are not giggling at me, right? You're giggling with me. What comes out of the human heart is sometimes beautiful and sometimes it's just broken. Sometimes it's aggressive, sometimes it's defensive, sometimes it's godly and sometimes it's godless. And that's why Jesus, who called himself the truth, wanted something better for me and you than what's in here. He wanted some sort of outside standard that we could use to evaluate our hearts, our thoughts, our actions, and our desires. And today I want to share with you what that is. I did some really nerdy slash really great Bible research on the word truth. Grab your pen and write this down. Here's what I learned. Cover to cover in the Bible, the word truth shows up 137 different times. 137. What I was curious about was how many of those 137 fell into the, the concept of the truth. Like objective, that doesn't matter how I feel, it's the truth. And then how many of them were in this more subjective internal concept of my truth. Right? 137 different options. Here's what I found. 99 times. 99 times in the Bible before the word truth is the word the. 99 times. Like the Bible almost can't bring up the word truth without the definite article, the truth. Which leaves 38 left over. So how many times when the word truth came up, did the little word my come before it? The Bible's answer is zero. Never. Not once. The phrase your truth showed up three times in the Bible, but only when someone was speaking to, to God. We hear it constantly. Moana builds its rhythmic message into our hearts, but Jesus would say, I'm sorry, but no. The truth is never yours or mine. It's never his or hers. It's never theirs. It's the truth. It's God's unchanging truth. That's why in, in maybe the most important verse for this entire series, Jesus spoke these words. He was praying to his father and he said, Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So today, before I land this plane, I have some homework for you. I want you to memorize those words from Jesus. I've last put John 17, verse 17 back up on the screen. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. In fact, I'm even going to make you a deal today. I'm only going to make you memorize half of that. Your word is truth. Come back next week. There's going to be a quiz. Your word is truth. The blank will say, blank is truth. And you're going to have to say, yeah, your word is truth. Let's practice it together, right? Your word is truth. One more time. Your word is truth. If you would say, God, I want to know the truth. I want to know what to do, but I can't unless I know what's true. And we'd say, oh yeah, Father, your word is truth. Our Father in heaven cannot go a single day without thinking, gushing, loving every son and every daughter that he has. <laughs> and you might not believe that just yet, but I don't care what you believe. It's true. Because, Father, your word is truth. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for not agreeing with us. Uh, if we had to come up with our own faith, there would always be strings attached. There would always be X number of sinful strikes and then we'd be out. So grace, unconditional love, <laughs> a God who runs the universe, who cares about stubbed toes and job cuts and social media, that we would never think of that. So thank you, Father, that you know the truth. And thank you, Father, that you revealed the truth in your word. 
that it will challenge us. For some of us, it will, it will force us and command us and demand of us to carry a cross and deny what's inside of our own hearts. And Father, you know that's going to be hard. But Father, you also know that listening to you is infinitely better than not. That no one would speak words of mercy like this, of patience like this, of unconditional love like this. So Father, we, we trust your truth. <laughs> even when we don't feel it, even when the world says otherwise, today we make a commitment to trust your truth. Because if the Son of God comes down from heaven and gives his life on the cross, for the deceived and the straying and those who are lying to themselves. You, you, you must be trustworthy, Father. So we put everything into your hands. We put money and morality. We put family. We put dating. We put sexuality. We, we put work. We put everything into your hands and we just pray today, Father, speak to us because we have come to believe that your word is the truth. We pray this all in the saving name of your son, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Just what is truth? How do we know what to do if we're not even sure what's true anymore? In today's culture, we're told to be true to ourselves. But what if my truth is different from your truth? In a world drowning in personal opinions, half-truths, intellectual arguments, and blatantly biased news feeds, Jesus invites us to find solid ground to stand on in the unchanging truth of God's word. The world doesn't need Christians to win arguments on cultural issues. It needs us to share the truth of God's word lovingly because Jesus says that truth will set people free. We want to help you by sending you our newest book, Truth in Our Time. In this book, Dr. Paul Kelm, a contributing writer for Time of Grace, confronts common lies and half-truths, such as, it's my body, I can do what I want with it. You owe it to yourself to do what makes you happy. You have to learn to love yourself. Truth in Our Time is our way of thanking you for your financial support. Request yours when you give by calling 800-661-3311. Visit timeofgrace.org. Write us at P.O. Box 301. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53201 to give today. Time of Grace doesn't end here. Visit timeofgrace.org and explore encouraging resources or sign up for our daily email and have everything delivered right to your inbox. Like our Grace Moments devotions, Grace Talks devotional videos, blog, and podcasts. Follow us on social media where you'll find a supportive Christian community. If you need prayer, give us a call and let us know what's on your heart. Thank you so much for your support. See you next week on Time of Grace.